when we come to Christ. So I want to reread that section because it's, it's going to be what he talks about for the next half of the book. So chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In this text, he begins to outline this, this difference between living in the flesh and living in the Spirit. And some of these words Paul uses a little bit differently or uniquely than you and I tend to use them in everyday life. In Pauline literature, when he says the flesh, he uses it in multiple ways, and I'm going to outline kind of three for you. There's certain texts where he uses it quite literally, this, this Greek word, it's, it's sarx for those that are, are interested in that, but he uses it literally, and so he says you're circumcised in the flesh. That means literally circumcised in your body. He uses it referring to humanity in general. And so he says, Jews are being, uh, are his tribe, the, that he is of the tribes of, Jew, of the Jews. And in that he says, katasarka. He uses that word again. It's in Romans 9, 3 where he says that. He's saying, from a physical point of view, I am part of the Jewish tribe. I am part of the nation of Jews. Or when he talks about Jesus, he uses it the same way. And he says, Jesus is the son of David, katasarka, from a human perspective or on his human side. And so he, refer, he uses this word to refer to humanity, this word that is translated flesh. But in this text, he uses it in a much more unique way. And almost one that in some ways he coins. You and I think of it this way, even in our conversations, especially if you've grown up in church, we, we think about this in our English language language as well, but when he says you're in the flesh, he's using it in a moral way to describe our unredeemed humanness. I'm going to read a bit of a quote, a longer quote from someone who I think outlines this a little bit better than, than I'll be able to, but he says when Paul uses this word sarx, he uses it in a way that is all his own. When he's talking of Christians, he talks of the days when we were in the flesh, he speaks of those who walk according to the flesh, in contradistinction to those who live the Christian life. He says that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He says that the mind of the flesh is death, and that it is hostile to God. He talks about living according to the flesh. He says to his Christian friends, you are not in the flesh. Now, certainly, especially in that last instance, he's not saying that you're not in the body. He's not using it in a physical, literal sense. As we say flesh and blood, that's not what he's saying. How then is he using it? He really means human nature in all its weakness, and he means human in its vulnerability to sin. He means that part of human which gives sin its bridgehead. He means sinful human nature, apart from Christ, everything that attaches a person to the world instead of to God. To live according to the flesh is to live a life dominated by the dictates and desires of sinful human nature instead of life dominated by the dictates and the desires of the love of God. The flesh is the lower side of human nature. This is what Paul's talking about when he speaks of how we used to live in the flesh. We were attached to this idea of sinfulness. He makes it clear, too, that he's not just talking about sexual sin or literally physical sin. In Galatians 5, 19, another book written by Paul, he says this about the flesh. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this passage is clear that he lists some things that he calls acts of the flesh that are very physical in nature. Some of these sins have a physical idea to them. But others are more about thought and speaking. 
hatred and discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. And these two he calls acts of the flesh. And so in this word, he's talking about all the things that draw us into sinful thoughts, deeds, and actions. Although the believer can at times still manifest deeds of the flesh, once saved, we are no longer in the flesh. Our identity is not defined by our sin nature, but is defined by Christ. We become men and women of the Spirit. And that's the contrast that he makes in this text for today, is that the flesh is contracts contrasted to the spirit and it's a black and white idea for Paul you're either in one fully engrossed in it or in the other and fully engrossed in it the spirit when he talks about it well in other places he uses a whole lot of different ideas for what how that word is translated panumate in the Greek mostly in this text he's talking about the person of God and his dwelling inside of us And so when he says the Spirit, that tends to be what he's talking about in this text, except for verse 16 where he refers to our spirit, the part of our being which is metaphysical. But for the most part, he's talking about the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, that part of God that connects us to him and lives inside of us. And he contrasts these two ideas, the flesh and the Spirit. They're incompatible in his mind. It's black and white. There's no, I'm partly in one camp and partly in the other. It's one or the other. Now, what I want to make clear is when he's contrasting this idea of the flesh and the spirit, it's not about the physical world being inherently evil and the spiritual world being inherently good. Quite the opposite. He says that there are those that are all about evil, whose hearts, minds, and even spirits are connected to that evilness in the world. And there are those that are about the Spirit of God, whose hearts, minds, and even their very being is being transformed by him into something greater. It's about who you align your life with, whether you align it to gratify your own desires or to allow Christ to transform your mind and heart to reflect righteous living. So let's take a look at verses 5 through 8 together. Now those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Now he gives lots of signs of where your allegiance is in your mind in this text. A sign of allegiance to God is that you submit to the law that he has presented in his word. That you don't take your own ideas and merge them into it or try to define moral law by what you think is right or wrong, but you allow God's word to speak the truth of what he defines as morally right or wrong. And if you are submitted to Christ, there is a sense of life and peace in your heart and in your mind. Now, we often discuss how sin leads to death in church. We talk about this idea that sin is connected to death, and we usually think about it in a physical sense. We understand that when sin came into the world, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, that there was this time where they were separated from the tree of life, and that they would then come to a spot where they would physically die. That was a direct result of the sin that they committed. And you and I are a part of that reality in the world in which we live now. At times we even stretch it as far to talk about a spiritual death, that there is a separation from God that is worse than physical death. And we speak of that as a result of sin, this spiritual death that comes about. But this text outlines how sin has had a great effect on the human mind as well. And Paul does this throughout his writings. When we think that we understand sin, he, he just stretches it even a little bit more for us to understand the gravity of what sin does in this world. 
And so he says that sin in this world affects our very minds. And this isn't a new idea. He's presented this idea already in the text. And so in Romans 1.21, he said, For although they knew God, this is the unsaved, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Further on in in verse 28 in the same chapter, he says, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they ought, so that they do what ought not to be done. In both of these texts, it makes it clear that one of the results of sin is that even our pattern of thoughts is affected. That our, when we deny who God is, that God hands us over to this futile way of thinking that is twisted and perverted by our own desires or what Paul calls the flesh. And so our thoughts and our ideas, our whole way of looking at the world becomes depraved because God hands us over to that, allows us to enter into that. But in this text, he makes it clear that for those of us that are in Christ, where that is our identity, when that is who we are, even that part of sin is dealt with. That our minds are capable to grasp the truth of God once again. That we are able to please God once again. That we are able to think in right ways about how this world works and what is going on. There's a transformation that comes about and it it takes time in most of us. It's not instantaneous and it's probably something we never arrive at. It's a process. But our mind changes. How we look at the world changes. How we think changes. Our mind itself is rewired. And I love that psychologists are starting to recognize that this is possible. That how our, our mind thinks the pathways that are used can be rewired as we grow and as we change. That while we were once always led in that direction, if we follow through enough and if we change the pattern, we can initiate a different response. Let's go down to verse 9 and, and read to, the, uh, to verse 17, the last part of our text that we'll look at today. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The text tells us to put to death the misdeeds of our body, of the flesh. In verse 13 it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. There's some things about our coming to Christ that are instantaneous, that happen in a moment. We are pronounced righteous. Our name is written in the book of life. There are things that happen that cannot be undone because they are things that God does. But dealing with sin in our life, killing sin in our life, is a bit of a process. As this verse says, It's not instantaneous at conversion. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. 
seems to be something that we work out in our salvation. We have a role, and the Spirit of God has a role in the process of dealing with sin in our lives, but it makes it clear also that we are no longer slaves to sin, that that bond has been broken, and we ought to act and behave like we're slaves to righteousness, to Christ. We ought to connect with that idea and live out of that identity. More so than that, we're not just slaves to it. We're not, we're not considered that part of the household. We are considered co-heirs with Christ. There's a word in here that they didn't gender neutralize, and part of that was deliberate. It, they say that we've taken on a sonship. And part of that comes from, Jew, from Jewish understanding of what adoption and what inheritance is. And so this is Paul saying to the men and women in the audience in a society that had very different ideas of inheritance for men and women. He's saying to them all, men and women, that you will be treated, like, that by God you will be treated as if you are co-heirs, firstborn sons. That you will have a full inheritance in eternity. That while gender has an effect here on earth, it will not in these eternal things. It says you've been adopted into the family of God and you are co-heirs with Christ. Man, that's a humbling thought. That in God's eyes, we are treated as sons just like Jesus. That that's how he sees those who are in Christ. Christ. So often I think that he sees all my shortcomings, my, my stubby tongue and my misspeaking and, and the failings that I have, the sin that I'm struggling with, that I'm in the process of dealing with, those, those shortcomings and, and failures in my life. But in this text, he reminds us that God sees us as a co-heir. That if you are in Jesus, this is how he sees you. When he looks at you, he sees a son. He sees someone that is part of his family and has been adopted into it with full rights within it. It's not something that can be undone. Those that talk about this idea of adoption often like pointing out that in Jewish culture, it was actually easier to disown your own son than it was somebody you'd adopted because the legal framework was so heavy in adoption. Once that was complete, there was no going back. You could kick your own son out of your house, but a legally adopted son, you had responsibilities to for the rest of your life. We've been adopted into the family of God. He's taken responsibility for us, and we are heirs of the kingdom of God. He ends this section with this little disclaimer, and it's what we're going to talk about next week. He says, if indeed we share in his sufferings, there is meant to be a cost to our faith. Far too often when people talk about what it is to be a Christian, we talk about all the good things and we never talk about the sufferings. If we're honest about what Christ says about it, he says, if Christ suffers, but what God says about our life as Christians, he says, if Christ suffers, we will suffer as well. If Christ was rejected here on earth, how, how do we expect the world to accept us? If the minds of the world has been so twisted that it can't see the goodness of God anymore or even acknowledge his existence, why do we think we'll have an easy life in this world? Those things are at odds with one another. And this text, even more than the ones that came before, describes just how different these two allegiances are. And so we should expect hardship and suffering. It's part of the Christian experience. And when we suffer in it, we also participate with Christ in it. We become a part of what he experienced and we become a part of his plan. And so we should expect suffering. In some ways, we should embrace it. Something we don't talk about in this world because we like the goodness. We like the Abba Father part of this verse. But we are to share in his sufferings as well and to expect to be a part of that. We'll talk about that more next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this reminder that we are heirs with your son, that you see us as sons, that you have chosen us and you have adopted us. And Lord, that we have a great inheritance in your kingdom. Lord, we praise you and thank you for that. Lord, where we get distracted by the ways of this world, by, by the physical things around us, may you remind us that our allegiance is to you, to the Holy Spirit that you have put within us.
that he confirms where our hearts sit. Lord, I pray that where there is sin within us, that we would put it to death as your word instructs us to, that your spirit would point to it and bring about conviction in our hearts, that we would understand what is evil and what is good, and that out of that, Lord, there would be action in our minds, that they'd be rewritten to be able to serve and honor you better, to be minds that are righteous, that our hearts would be rewritten, that we wouldn't be attracted towards those things that bring shame to us. And that we would be forgiven for our actions past and present, God. That we would truly repent and not turn back to them. But that we would, that we would act out of that freedom that we've been granted. To live as those that are committed to you wholeheartedly. To have peace and joy in our lives. In the midst of hardship and suffering. To recognize that this world is but a flash an eternity awaits us where we are co-heirs with Christ. Lord, you are so good to us. We praise you and thank you this morning for that. In your name we pray, amen. stand and join us again. We're going to close with holy, holy, holy. We'll do verse 1 and 4. God promises in his word the gift of his spirit to those that believe. That spirit is the very presence of God in our lives. Verse 14, he says, For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. Go in peace, praising our God. Thank mm-hmm. you.